Chief Justice Roberts Concurring in the Judgment We granted certiori to decide one question, whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. That question is directly implicated here. Mississippi's Gestational Age Act generally prohibits abortion after the 15th week of pregnancy, several weeks before a fetus is regarded as viable outside the womb. In urging our review, Mississippi stated that its case was an ideal vehicle to reconsider the bright line viability rule and that a judgment in its favor would not require the court to overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood of Southwestern Pennsylvania v. Casey. Today, the court nonetheless rules for Mississippi by doing just that. I would take a more measured course. I agree with the court that the viability line established by Roe and Casey should be discarded under a straightforward stare decisis analysis. That line never made any sense. Our abortion precedents describe the right at issue as a woman's right to choose to terminate her pregnancy. That right should therefore extend far enough to ensure a reasonable opportunity to choose, but need not extend any further, certainly not all the way to viability. Mississippi's law allows a woman three months to obtain an abortion, well beyond the point at which it is considered late to discover a pregnancy. I see no sound basis for questioning the adequacy of that opportunity. But that is all I would say, out of adherence to a simple yet fundamental principle of judicial restraint. If it is not necessary to decide more to dispose of a case, then it is necessary not to decide more. Perhaps we are not always perfect in following that command, and certainly there are cases that warrant an exception. But this is not one of them. Surely, we should adhere closely to principles of judicial restraint here where the broader path the court chooses entails repudiating a constitutional right we have not only previously recognized, but also expressly reaffirmed applying the doctrine of stare decisis. The court's opinion is thoughtful and thorough, but those virtues cannot compensate for the fact that its dramatic and consequential ruling is unnecessary to decide the case before us. Let me begin with my agreement with the court on the only question we need to decide here, whether to retain the rule from Roe and Casey that a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy extends up to the point that the fetus is regarded as viable outside the womb. I agree that this rule should be discarded. First, this court seriously erred in Roe in adopting viability as the earliest point at which a state may legislate to advance its substantial interests in the area of abortion. Roe set forth a rigid three-part framework anchored to viability, which more closely resembled a regulatory code than a body of constitutional law. That framework, moreover, came out of thin air. Neither the Texas statute challenged in Roe nor the Georgia statute at issue in its companion case, Doe v. Bolton, included any gestational age limit no party or amicus asked the court to adopt a bright line viability rule. And as for Casey, arguments for or against the viability rule played only a de minimis role in the party's briefing and in the oral argument. It is thus hardly surprising that neither Roe nor Casey made a persuasive or even colorable argument for why the time for terminating a pregnancy must extend to viability. The court's jurisprudence on this issue is a textbook illustration of the perils of deciding a question neither presented nor briefed. As has been often noted, Rowe's defense of the line boiled down to the circular assertion that the state's interest is compelling only when an unborn child can live outside the womb, because that is when the unborn child can live outside the womb.
20 years later, the best defense of the viability line the Casey plurality could conjure up was workability. Although the plurality attempted to add more content by opining that it might be said that a woman who fails to act before viability has consented to the state's intervention on behalf of the developing child. That mere suggestion provides no basis for choosing viability as the critical tipping point. A similar implied consent argument could be made with respect to a law banning abortions after 15 weeks, well beyond the point at which nearly all women are aware that they are pregnant. The dissent, which would retain the viability line, offers no justification for it either. This court's jurisprudence, since Casey, moreover, has eroded the underpinnings of the viability line, such as they were. The viability line is a relic of a time when we recognized only two state interests warranting regulation of abortion, maternal health and protection of potential life. That changed with Gonzalez v. Carhartt. There, we recognized a broader array of interests, such as drawing a bright line that clearly distinguishes abortion and infanticide, maintaining societal ethics, and preserving the integrity of the medical profession. The viability line has nothing to do with advancing such permissible goals. Consider, for example, statutes passed in a number of jurisdictions that forbid abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy, premised on the theory that a fetus can feel pain at that stage of development. Assuming that prevention of fetal pain is a legitimate state interest after Gonzales, there seems to be no reason why viability would be relevant to the permissibility of such laws. The same is true of laws designed to protect the integrity and ethics of the medical profession and restrict procedures likely to coarsen society to the dignity of human life. Mississippi's law, for instance, was premised in part on the legislature's finding that the dilation and evacuation procedure is a barbaric practice dangerous for the maternal patient, and demeaning to the medical profession. That procedure accounts for most abortions performed after the first trimester, two weeks before the period at issue in this case, and involves the use of surgical instruments to crush and tear the unborn child apart. Again, it would make little sense to focus on viability when evaluating a law based on these permissible goals. In short, the viability rule was created outside the ordinary course of litigation, is and always has been completely unreasoned, and fails to take account of state interests since recognized as legitimate. It is indeed telling that other countries almost uniformly eschew a viability line. Only a handful of countries among them, China and North Korea, permit elective abortions after 20 weeks. The rest have coalesced around a 12-week line. The court rightly rejects the arbitrary viability rule today. None of this, however, requires that we also take the dramatic step of altogether eliminating the abortion right first recognized in Roe. Mississippi itself previously argued as much to this court in this litigation. When the state petitioned for our review, its basic request was straightforward. Clarify whether abortion prohibitions before viability are always unconstitutional. The state made a number of strong arguments that the answer is no. Arguments that, as discussed, I find persuasive, and it went out of its way to make clear that it was not asking the court to repudiate entirely the right to choose whether to terminate a pregnancy. To be clear, the questions presented in this petition do not require the court to overturn Roe or Casey.
Mississippi tempered that statement with an oblique one-sentence footnote intimating that if the court could not reconcile Roe and Casey with current facts or other cases, it should not retain erroneous precedent. But the state never argued that we should grant review for that purpose. After we granted certiorari, however, Mississippi changed course. In its principal brief, the state bluntly announced that the court should overrule Roe and Casey. The Constitution does not protect a right to an abortion, it argued, and a state should be able to prohibit elective abortions if a rational basis supports doing so. The court now rewards that gambit, noting three times that the parties presented no half measures and argued that we must either reaffirm or overrule Roe and Casey. Given those two options, the majority picks the latter. This framing is not accurate. In its brief on the merits, Mississippi in fact argued at length that a decision simply rejecting the viability rule would result in a judgment in its favor. But even if the state had not argued as much, it would not matter. There is no rule that parties can confine this court to disposing of their case on a particular ground, let alone when review was sought and granted on a different one. Our established practice is instead not to formulate a rule of constitutional law broader than is required by the precise facts to which it is to be applied. Following that fundamental principle of judicial restraint, we should begin with the narrowest basis for disposition, proceeding to consider a broader one only if necessary to resolve the case at hand. It is only where there is no valid narrower ground of decision that we should go on to address a broader issue such as whether a constitutional decision should be overturned. Here, there is a clear path to deciding this case correctly without overruling Roe all the way down to the studs. Recognize that the viability line must be discarded, as the majority rightly does, and leave for another day whether to reject any right to an abortion at all. If that is the basis for Roe, Roe's viability line should be scrutinized from the same perspective and there is nothing inherent in the right to choose that requires it to extend to viability or any other point, so long as a real choice is provided. Of course, such an approach would not be available if the rationale of Roe and Casey was inextricably entangled with and dependent upon the viability standard. It is not. Our precedents in this area ground the abortion right in a woman's right to choose. To be sure, in reaffirming the right to an abortion, Casey termed the viability rule Roe's central holding. Other cases of ours have repeated that language. But simply declaring it does not make it so. The question in Roe was whether there was any right to an abortion in the Constitution. How far the right extended was a concern that was separate and subsidiary, and, not surprisingly, entirely unbriefed. The court in Roe just chose to address both issues in one opinion. It first recognized the right to choose to terminate a pregnancy under the Constitution, and then, having done so, explained that a line should be drawn at viability such that a state could not proscribe abortion before that period. The viability line is a separate rule flushing out the meets and bounds of Roe's core holding. Applying principles of stare decisis, I would excise that additional rule, and only that rule, from our jurisprudence. The majority lists a number of cases that have stressed the importance of the viability rule to our abortion precedents. I agree that, whether it was originally holding or dictum, the viability line is clearly part of our past precedent, 
and the court has applied it as such in several cases since Roe. My point is that Roe adopted two distinct rules of constitutional law. One, that a woman has the right to choose to terminate a pregnancy. Two, that such right may be overridden by the state's legitimate interests when the fetus is viable outside the womb. The latter is obviously distinct from the former. I would abandon that timing rule, but see no need in this case to consider the basic right. The court contends that it is impossible to address Roe's conclusion that the Constitution protects the woman's right to abortion without also addressing Roe's rule that the state's interests are not constitutionally adequate to justify a ban on abortion until viability. But we have partially overruled precedents before and certainly have never held that a distinct holding defining the contours of a constitutional right must be treated as part and parcel of the right itself. Overruling the subsidiary rule is sufficient to resolve this case in Mississippi's favor. The law at issue allows abortions up through 15 weeks, providing an adequate opportunity to exercise the right Roe protects. By the time a pregnant woman has reached that point, her pregnancy is well into the second trimester. Pregnancy tests are now inexpensive and accurate, and a woman ordinarily discovers she is pregnant by six weeks of gestation. Almost all know by the end of the first trimester. Safe and effective abortifacients, moreover, are now readily available, particularly during those early stages. Given all this, it is no surprise that the vast majority of abortions happen in the first trimester. Presumably, most of the remainder would also take place earlier if later abortions were not a legal option. Ample evidence thus suggests that a 15-week ban provides sufficient time, absent rare circumstances, for a woman to decide for herself whether to terminate her pregnancy. Whether a precedent should be overruled is a question entirely within the discretion of the court. In my respectful view, the sound exercise of that discretion should have led the court to resolve the case on the narrower grounds set forth above, rather than overruling Roe and Casey entirely. The court says there is no principled basis for this approach but in fact it is firmly grounded in basic principles of stare decisis and judicial restraint. The court's decision to overrule Roe and Casey is a serious jolt to the legal system, regardless of how you view those cases. A narrower decision rejecting the misguided viability line would be markedly less unsettling, and nothing more is needed to decide this case. Our cases say that the effect of overruling a precedent on reliance interests is a factor to consider in deciding whether to take such a step, and respondents argue that generations of women have relied on the right to an abortion in organizing their relationships and planning their futures. The court questions whether these concerns are pertinent under our precedents. But the issue would not even arise with the decision rejecting only the viability line. It cannot reasonably be argued that women have shaped their lives in part on the assumption that they would be able to abort up to viability, as opposed to 15 weeks. In support of its holding, the court cites three seminal constitutional decisions that involved overruling prior precedents. Brown v. Board of Education, 1954, West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett, 1943, and West Coast Hotel v. Parrish, 1937. The opinion in Brown was unanimous and 11 pages long. This one is neither. Barnett was decided only three years after the decision it overruled, 
three justices having had second thoughts, and West Coast Hotel was issued against a backdrop of unprecedented economic despair that focused attention on the fundamental flaws of existing precedent. It also was part of a sea change in this court's interpretation of the Constitution, signaling the demise of an entire line of important precedents, a feature the court expressly disclaims in today's decision. None of these leading cases, in short, provides a template for what the court does today. The court says we should consider whether to overrule Roe and Casey now, because if we delay, we would be forced to consider the issue again in short order. There would be turmoil until we did so, according to the court, because of existing state laws with shorter deadlines or no deadline at all. But under the narrower approach proposed here, state laws outlawing abortion altogether would still violate binding precedent. And to the extent states have laws that set the cutoff date earlier than 15 weeks, any litigation over that time frame would proceed free of the distorting effect that the viability rule has on our constitutional debate. The same could be true, for that matter, with respect to legislative consideration in the states. We would then be free to exercise our discretion in deciding whether and when to take up the issue from a more informed perspective. Both the court's opinion and the dissent display a relentless freedom from doubt on the legal issue that I cannot share. I am not sure, for example, that a ban on terminating a pregnancy from the moment of conception must be treated the same under the Constitution as a ban after 15 weeks. A thoughtful member of this court once counseled that the difficulty of a question admonishes us to observe the wise limitations on our function and to confine ourselves to deciding only what is necessary to the disposition of the immediate case. I would decide the question we granted review to answer, whether the previously recognized abortion right bars all abortion restrictions prior to viability, such that a ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy is necessarily unlawful. The answer to that question is no, and there is no need to go further to decide this case. I therefore concur only in the judgment.